Hi, uh, I'm Tiffany Jernigan. I am a developer advocate at VMware. So, forewarning, this is my first time giving a security talk because I had a, I didn't really do security beforehand. So the whole goal of this thing was learn security to be able to talk about it for people who are not already security experts. So if you're already a security expert and focused on security, you'll know everything in here. And you can tell me if I did something wrong later too. All right, so you're here for 40 minutes or if you decide to walk out early, I won't cry too hard. Um, this is my first time giving a conference talk besides like those smaller events since 2018. So a little bit nervous, but thanks for coming. Also. That's an awesome mask. All right. So hopefully my clicker is nice to me since sometimes it's not. All right, so less is more. So basically the opposite of what is happening on this slide right now, because there's a bunch there. Um, so basically the less you have, the more secure that you can be. So basically you want to have things like less code. So if possible, you can use like existing security solutions instead of going and creating your own. Also, off the shelf likely has maybe more effort focused on that specific thing, since that's one of the things they're trying to specifically create, and therefore may have more eyeballs on it, unless you hire your own like entire team to do it. It may therefore be better unless you want to go take the effort and do that. Um, also, give fewer permissions. For instance, basically only give the permissions that someone actually needs. Don't go around just giving admin permissions to every single person. If I did that to everyone here, someone might be like, hey, I don't like you, so I'm just going to like delete everything. Sucks. Um, also, avoid having long-lived secrets. Have fewer dependencies, so you're minimizing the attack surface. For instance, you may want to use something like a distro list image instead of using Ubuntu. Also, keep up with whatever the latest recommendations are. This keeps changing. Things keep evolving. People keep finding out new things. Um, one of the things that you can go to is that link in the Kubernetes docs, and you can periodically check it as to what they suggest for a security checklist if you're specifically dealing with Kubernetes. So the Kubernetes documentation breaks down cloud native security into four Cs. I stole this graphic from there. Um, so there's cloud, cluster, container, and code. So as a practitioner, practitioner, I can't even talk, I'm so nervous. Uh, you have to think about hardening your infrastructure at every single level. So every single one of these you need to worry about. You can't just be like, I care about one thing and not care about the rest. Maybe as a specific person, you can worry about one thing because you have maybe a big team and there's people dealing with each part of that, but you can't ignore it. So first I'm going to start talking about things with platform and cluster components. So unless you need to run everything yourself, or you need to have all that kind of specific access, for instance, say you want to be able to do very specific things inside the control plane, I suggest using a managed Kubernetes offering. Basically, managed services take care of a lot of the work for you, so that means there are fewer places that you can potentially make mistakes and then therefore have more issues with security. Um, security and hardening is one of the primary value adds for these cloud platforms already. So for specifically for securing control planes and nodes. So you might hear the word hardening a lot when people talk about security. So basically make sure you harden the control plane. So for instance, only allow people to interact with the API server via the Kubernetes APIs. Uh, if you go to the Kubernetes docs, which has a lot of stuff, um, it will tell you how to do things like restricting access to etcd. So like the less that you have running on your control plane servers, the fewer potential like places that people can go and attack and exploit to be able to gain access to your cluster. So like, for instance, you also might want to deal with like, with, like if your pod can have, if your pod has access to something, um, like it can do things like obtaining uh, node credentials. And that could be a problem um, because other, other people might be able to get access to your node, which you don't want to have happen. Um, you want to be able to do things. You want to do things like using uh, TLS certs. So you can use something like Let's Encrypt, for instance. Basically, don't be lazy and uh, do the that little flag there of the skip TLS cert verification. Uh, or basically, it's as good as not using TLS at all. Um, there is a talk by uh, Tabby Sable called uh, PKI the Wrong Way. So in that, um, it is from KubeCon a little while ago. 
and um, basically it's demonstrated how the end, like the end user's ability to be able to create certificates from MTLS and how that can be used to gain access to the entire cluster. So for instance, that shows like why you would want to restrict access to etcd. And obviously, things like that happening is really bad. Basically, etcd, it goes and it assumes that like if you can successfully authenticate with MTLS, you have proper access. Did that actually move on? OK, cool. Um, so also make sure that you have uh, pod security standards. You want to be able to make it so that others shouldn't have access that they shouldn't have. Um, up until 1.21, uh, the default way of going about that, you may have been dealing with pod security uh, policies. And that's being, that was deprecated in 1.21 in favor of uh, pod security standards. Lots of acronyms. There's a lot there. Um, so there's also, if you're uh, dealing with like running stuff specifically, like on, say, some cloud provider, uh, there is a cloud metadata server. And that's where like credentials are given into the virtual machine. You basically never want your pods to have access to that. Lots of pretty scary vulnerabilities can happen there um, that if you allow attackers to have access to the metadata server. So like, for instance, they could get uh, credentials associated with your VM service account. That would not be good at all. And um, the link there, um, Jerome Pedazzoni has a uh, YAML that basically gives uh, attacker root access to your nodes if you don't have those things. So you can play around with that. So upgrading Kubernetes. Um, you want to make sure that you're upgrading Kubernetes. You don't want to be just like install, set up Kubernetes, and then just be like, OK, everything's great. Continue on. Like there's a few reasons why that could be bad. Some of them include finding big CVEs and wanting you to move past that. So Kubernetes is basically designed so that upgrades can be relatively seamless. You don't have to go and be like, hey, here's my cluster. Let me kill off everything after I create like a new like create a new cluster, move everything over. You don't have to do all of that stuff. Like you may have had to do like back in the day. Um, it's basically gone a long way since OpenStack. Um, so again, a lot of people are still using very old versions of Kubernetes, which is not great. <laughs> um, and the more times that, like the more often you upgrade, the more seamless that is. Um, if you're using a managed offering, you might even have a, an option there to enable auto upgrades. Or if you don't, you can, it's usually like a one step click button for updating what versions on your nodes, what versions on your control plane, et cetera. Um, basically try to stay up to date with whatever the latest patches are. Um, if you're scared about what could go wrong, most likely things won't be breaking. But when you're upgrading, especially if you're doing it, you're not waiting like extreme amount of time or to the point where things are starting to get deprecated. So you might see some of those warnings there. So for your enjoyment, uh, this is the list of the things that you need to do if you are specific going through manually updating each thing of your cluster. So first, you'd have to update your control plane, then your nodes, things like kubectl, and then um, adjusting like the manifest and other resources based on like whatever is changing with the API. And if you are running your entire own Kubernetes cluster, there's a lot of little things that you have to manage with that. Hence the whole suggestion of dealing using a managed Kubernetes offering, because they deal with a lot of this stuff for you and making sure versions and all these things uh, go all together. So isolating compute. So um, quotas and limits, they can be used so like basically noisy neighbors uh, don't affect other workloads that are on the same host. Um, this can also prevent an attacker from using your infrastructure for like DDoS or crypto mining, which you probably don't want someone else doing. Um, you can use taints and tolerations to schedule workloads away from each other. You can also add another layer of security by using things like sandbox container runtimes. So there's things like Gvisor, there's Kata, there's Firecracker. Basically, these add another layer of compute isolation between the containerized workload and the underlying uh, OS kernel by adding another layer of virtualization. So basically, a lot of these things just keep adding more separation, so it's harder for people to be able to attack. So there's only one thing on here, because I really don't know much of anything about storage in the security realm. But uh, there is the Container Storage Interface, or CSI. 
As you see, people love acronyms, but it makes it easier than saying out the whole thing. Um, so it's a standard for exposing arbitrary block and file storage systems to containerized workloads on container orchestration systems like Kubernetes. And you can go, I could, should have put a link there saying how much empty slide I have there. Sorry. So uh, isolating network resources. So by default with Kubernetes, um, every pod can talk to every other pod. If you're not cool with that, you want to be able, you want to use uh, network policies. So Kubernetes also assumes that you trust the underlying network. So for example, the network of your cloud provider. You may not. So if you don't, one way to address that is to set up a service mesh. So with having like full end-to-end -end encryption, for example, with MTLS, so, some people might say that's overkill. It just everything with security, to, well, not everything, but a certain level of things with security depends on what you specifically need and how far you need to go with that. Um, you could also go the extra mile and you could use tools like Cilium for things like advanced network policies. For instance, you could do uh, filtering on specific IP, API routes. Um, so, for instance, if you want to have like a route that's like something user API v1 users or whatever and you want it to be able to talk to your pod to be able to specifically talk to just that, but you don't want that pod to be able to talk to, say, billing, for instance. And you can do that using uh, eBPF, which I am not getting into in this talk. But another key word to go Google or Bing or whatever later. So secrets. Um, secrets can have different RBAC permissions uh, if you go a little bit hardcore, you can even encrypt them at rest. Uh, there is a link up there for being able to do that or telling you how to do it via the Kubernetes docs. Again, yay, Kubernetes docs. Um, so basically, it supports encryption at rest, which will encrypt resources like secrets in etcd, basically preventing parties that gain access to your etcd backups from viewing the content of those secrets, which is very important. Also. Don't put your like the data of what is in your secret into directly into a config map. You want to put that into a secret and have your config map read from that secret. Basically, otherwise it's just like plain text password somewhere. So even better, uh, don't put stuff directly into your secrets, but use something that will do, put them in there for you. So basically, the whole point there is to like avoid committing secrets to say your Git repos, which you might find obvious, but definitely ends up accidentally happening. So you don't want to manage secrets yourself unless you really have to. You basically want to use some sort of like key management system such a, or service such as like HashiCorp Vault. Um, there's your cloud provider's KMS or key management service. Again, more acronyms um, if you're using one uh, for basically secret data encryption. So basically what I was mentioning a while ago, try leveraging the work that others have done to make your life easier versus starting from scratch on every single thing that you need. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of other things there. There's, uh, there's sealed secrets, there's camos and sops, and uh, by name you can Google them on when I, because I'm bad and I did not upload the slides yet. When I upload the slides, you'll be able to click on these things, which I will do after this talk. All right, so next section is on user management and permissions. So people, whether that's you, your devs, or who not, and robots, so like automated services and code running on your clusters, need to be able to talk to the Kubernetes API so they can do things like deploying things, scaling up, scaling down, rolling out new versions, monitoring, viewing logs, et cetera, basically all of the things. Um, but we don't want our autoscaler to do something like mining Bitcoin or developers running away with like the user credit card database or maybe more realistically someone steals their laptop who tries to get credit card information and laptop stealing definitely happens it definitely happened to me when I was in, on a like work trip a couple months ago whoops and um, so that's why we are going to not because it got stolen but the rest of what I said is why we're going to be talk going over uh, user management and permissions in this next section so there's two main things, which are AuthN, which is authentication, and AuthZ, which is authorization. Um, so basically, there's like a little separation there. So uh, AuthN is who are you? And AuthZ is basically what 
are you that specific person or robot or thing or whatever? What are you allowed to do? So with authentication, uh, Kubernetes is very flexible here. You can use things like uh, TLS certs, maybe with your own CA or not. Uh, you can use OIDC tokens with any OIDC provider. So there's like in-house things like Dex, Keycloak, or you can use SAS like Okta. Um, that can turn like in turn like plug in with whatever you're say if you're using a cloud provider using it with IAM. So for instance, you can map like cloud provider users to Kubernetes users for that. So um, if we go back thinking about what the best practices are, so use things that are short lived. Um, so for instance, you could use OAuth uh, access tokens instead of using a username and a password. Um, so there's things that like for specifically like for humans or everybody in here. Um, things, you could do things with like TLS, OIDC, service accounts, etc. Um, and then like in client, dealing with client certs. Um, so in Kubernetes, you don't basically create a user. Um, you give, hey, I want to give uh, create pods permissions uh, to like Bob. And as long as someone shows up with a valid cert or OIDC token for Bob, this person or thing or whatever can create pods. Um, and then robots, they end up using service accounts. There is also this project called Spiffy. Um, and you can use that for authenticating from one service to another. It's an advanced use case, but basically uh, short-lived identities can help you move away from long-lived secrets. So then uh, AuthZ or authorization. So again, that's basically, do you have permissions to do what you are trying to do? Um, say like, do you have permissions to create a pod? Can you do a get on this? Can like, can you delete things? Like, what is it that you're allowed to do? Um, so there, uh, the API server, there are a few API server authorization modes. So uh, there's Node, which is a special purpose authorization mode that grants permissions to kubelets based on the pods that are scheduled to run. Um, there's ABAC, which isn't used as much as mostly people uh, end up using RBAC, which is what I'm going to be talking about in the next part of the slides. Uh, there is also webhook. So webhook authorization allows you to use cu a custom authority system, such as what, plugging in whatever your existing system is. So I'm not going to give you a like, super accelerated course on RBAC, because in total we have 40 minutes. So it's, I'm just going to give you like a few little things. Um, so like the high level idea on Kubernetes um, is that you define something that is called a role. So this has a specific collection of permissions, so things that can be done. Like, can I list these pods? Can I create a deployment? Um, can I specifically scale up, scale down, or do something with a specific deployment or resource? Um, and then the next thing is you would bind that role to say you have a user, or you have a group, or you have some sort of service count. And you can do that either as a role binding or as a cluster role binding. And it's a bunch of YAML. Um, so also, once you have created these RBAC roles, don't just be like, hey, this is I created them. This is probably right. Or like manually be like, create pod. Do I have back? Can I do this? That's a lot. Um, so make sure to audit your RBAC. There are a bunch of tools that you can use to do that. So by default, kubectl has one that is uh, kubectl can I? And you can list the things that you specifically can do. Um, there are also those other ones here, which are a bunch of plugins that you can add and therefore be able to just use via kubectl as well, which is pretty cool. Um, note, though, that you can't take away permissions. You can't be like, here is admin access, and I'm going to take away, your, like, make it so you don't have access to, like, delete pods. Basically, each thing is that you're doing is you're granting access to each specific thing that they are allowed to do. So, yeah. Um, like, for instance, you can't be like, hey, this, I'm going to be like, oh, you can update, uh, like, deployments, and you can't do it to some specific one. You can, if you wanted to be able to do stuff like that, for instance, you could have things in separate namespaces where someone only has access to do things in one namespace and not in another. All right, so namespaces, again. Um, basically, uh, permissions can be defined cluster-wide, or you can do it in a specific namespace. So if you're just 
playing around with Kubernetes by default. You might have just default. You could give some permissions to do whatever they want there. But then you're like, hey, I have maybe some other uh, namespace of things that I don't want this person. Maybe I don't want them to see at all. Or I don't want them to be able to delete something in this one. I need to make sure this is working maybe once their playground, dev, prod, whatever you want to do. Um, so you can just give specific access based on that. They could even be an admin in their own namespace if you want them to. So maybe, for instance, you might have some sort of workshop and everything is running on the same cluster. And each person doing this workshop has their own namespace. And they can only do with stuff in that namespace. They can't go and be like, oh, I don't like the person next to me. I'm going to go delete everything they just did in this workshop so far. Or more specific things that are like maybe a little more hardcore than um, playing around in a workshop. Um, so there's a few gotchas. Um, I'm only going to, there are a bunch of gotchas, but I'm only going to uh, talk about a couple of them. Um, so for one, don't give admin permissions to just anyone. That might be obvious, but sometimes you may be in a hurry. You might not think about it. Be like, I just, I just want this person to do this one thing and it's easy. I'll just give them full access. Whether something it's intentional or an accident, things might happen. And you might regret it. Um, if you want to be lazier about it, maybe just give them access to a specific namespace. But again, the less permissions that you give someone, the better. Um, so there's this thing with a uh, list secret, like uh, being able to, if you want to like list secrets or just use list, for instance, um, at least last I checked with Kubernetes, um, basically you would assume that list just literally shows you a list. Let's say if you did on secrets, it would just show you here's what the secrets are. And that's all you could do. And that get is what you would use to see specific details about it. However, that is not the case. Uh, if you do list, you can actually get what is with the secrets as well. So for instance, like, hey, if you were to deploy some sort of ingress controller that manages TLS, the TLS certs are usually stored in secrets. So if the ingress controller, for instance, has access to be able to do list on those secrets, it actually has access to all of those secrets. So say if it's deployed cluster wide, as opposed to being like in a specific namespace, which is generally what ends up being default. Um, now this ingress controller has access to all of the secrets on your entire cluster. So not exactly great. <laughs> um, so if someone else be able to get into your cluster now and be like your ingress controller now, they can see all the secrets that you have ever. And at least if you don't have any sort of restrictions up there. So next up is software supply chain, which has been one of the big key terms that people have been talking about probably in like what, at least in the last year, if you, especially if you've been going to some of the KubeCon, uh, I guess KubeCon conferences, going to KubeCon. Um, so like to give, who here has a, like heard of supply chain security? Okay, cool. Small number of people. All right, so um, to give you an idea of like what it is in a way that is not specific to tech. Um, so there was a, a while ago, there was this thing that they termed as the Chicago Tylenol murders. Um, basically, uh, at some point along the path, uh, things were being put into the Tylenol that was uh, killing people. Um, they weren't sure where that was, so like, was it like, was it someone, was it like a man in the mill attack? Like, was it when they were getting the uh, Tylenol and they were passing it off elsewhere? Did someone mess with it then? Was it in the factory? So the factory you can view as like a CI CD pipeline. So um, you could, in at least in software, you could check that for say, I have two CI CD pipelines that are doing the exact same thing. Is something happening with one versus the other? Um, and basically, you could check, hey, is this binary the same as the other one? Um, then there's like threat modeling. There's like identifying like who are the actors in the organization? Is there like an angry employee or something like that? But basically for say like the Tylenol, there are so many steps along the way that you have to be like, where in this path did the, like someone put something into the Tylenol to cause this to happen? And you had to figure that out. So for instance, like, if you there's like a bunch of things so like there's things like um who has access to your source repositories like 
Is, what about the dependencies? How is your software built? Like, where are you storing things? How are they deployed? Basically, there's a whole trail of breadcrumbs that you can go through. So, like, say if a new vulnerability is disclosed, like, how do you determine one? Are you affected by it? And if you are, how do you deploy a fix or some sort of mitigation for what that is? Like, how do you know that you aren't unwillingly running some sort of like Bitcoin miner? Like, that could be happening, and you may have no idea about that. So basically, you can't be confident in what your in your software that you're running, like unless you know where it is coming from and how it got there. So things that you might want to do is like restrict the paths that code can take from source to production, and make sure that you trace deployed code back along each step of the supply chain. So uh, there's there's a number of questions that you need to be asking yourself or things that you need to be validating as you go, starting from write, just like writing your code all the way through the step of running it in production. So for instance, you need to check, hey, someone made a change. Does this change come from someone that I trust or is it just some random person? So one of the things that you can do use to be able to like maybe validate this is, so there's, a, there's this thing called SigStore. There's a bunch of projects within SigStore. Um, and there's a tool called git sign, and you can use that to sign your commits so that you are identifying basically who this person is with this commit. It's keyless, so you don't have to worry about using GPG keys. You can also, later down the path, I just figured I wouldn't mention, like put SigStore and then other things in SigStore, but um, there's also cosign, which you can use for signing container images. So after that, basically, like, uh, is the source coming from your source repo? Like, is the code, I, like say if you're pulling down code, is it actually from where you think it is? And then can only authorize people push to that? Like again, like you want to make sure that it's not just some random person that can push code up to your, uh, wherever you have your code stored. Um, when you're building your artifact, can, is it from a trusted source? Like can you actually trust the build system itself? Um, can you trust like where that build system is running and what it's running on? So like once your uh, artifact or your program is built, at that point, can you trust like where it's being pushed to? So the, whatever, let's say if it's a registry or if it's you're dealing with like npm or something like that, can only trusted people push to that. So ideally, um, the only thing that can be able to push to wherever you're trying to push to is your CI/CD pipeline. That way, you know specifically this is what is pushing, and it's not some. If you if I gave access to every single person in this room, for instance, that's a lot of people to figure out like who has pushed something and what's happening with that. So also make sure that you are dealing with vulnerability scanning for your images, um, so you can look for known CVEs. There are tools out there such as like Clear and Trivi. Um, some container registries, such as like Harbor, um, they have that built in where you can just turn on image scanning and pick which of the uh, tools that you want to be able to use for that. You should also consider using an OPA uh, implementation or open policy agent uh, for policy enforcement. So one of the options that they have is Gatekeeper. You could also use SigStore to, since they uh, provide an emission controller to assert image signatures and uh, attestations as well. And apparently I forgot a space there, but yeah, you get the idea. <laughs> All right, so um, some actual threat models um, of things that have actually happened. So um, for instance, someone might make change to code that you depend on. For instance, maybe they broke the code, or maybe they just decided they were going to delete everything there whether it's malicious or not, something happened. Um, for instance, someone might delete a package in NPM that's like widely used, such as Luftpad. Um, so basically, a thing to do to avoid this problem, because otherwise, say you have your code, it's pulling down code from somewhere else, and oh no, my everything broke. It's not working anymore. So you want to have immutable dependencies. So like, are you vendoring your dependencies? Or are you giving, or basically, if you aren't, you're effectively giving someone else arbitrary write permissions to what your, to your code, in a way. Um, another thing is uh, there was a SolarWinds attack. Um, it was an attack on build infrastructure. So basically, a uh, code that was produced by a build server had malicious code injected that allowed external access to it. So then people were able to basically inject malicious code and sign it with SolarWinds signing key, which is not good. 
Um, so one way to avoid that is to have ephemeral builds. Um, basically, don't have a dedicated machine that someone could just hack into. Um, you would want to have it so that basically you, you have a build, so it spins up a new machine on demand and then builds it at that point. Basically, if it doesn't exist, it can't be hacked. And then you can also have uh, hermetic builds, um, which is, are basically builds that don't have access to the outside world. So um, people, so th basically, the, I, so there's like, you have to deal with all those things I've already mentioned, um, which is a lot. If you memorized it, please uh, give me your memory, like memory skills, because I don't have them. Um, but there's a few more things that I wanted to mention that don't specifically fall into like platform or like RBAC or supply chain. So um, there are like, when you create a cluster, so say if you're like, I'm going to be on some sort of web console and I'm going to go click create cluster, or maybe you're using like EKS Cuddle or some other one like CLI tool to spin up some sort of cluster. At that point, your cluster is basically far from being production ready. It doesn't, it has a lot there for you, but it does not have everything. There are things that you might want, such as being able to back up your cluster. Like say something happens, if you are having backups, you could easily revert to what was there beforehand. Um, you can use tools such as a Valero to be able to do that. Um, another big thing is observability. So metrics can basically help you determine if things are going as expected or not. And then if they aren't, they can also be used to help you figure out what is happening. Whether maybe someone did something, or if in general, maybe just something broke. Um, good logging. That is super important. It's basically indispensable for having good security because we want to be able to audit who is doing what. You want to be able to see, did some new, for instance, did someone just get access to be able to do whatever they want in the cluster? Who did this specific thing so you can track to see what, why did something break or why did something happen and who did that? Like you want to be able to see like user and privilege changes, like things that are being created, uh, security events, interruptions to logging, etc. Basically log as much as you can in a way that is useful to you. Also, uh, don't forget at the end of the day, everything, if, assuming you are writing code, not running things that everyone else is doing, um, you are running code. If you have problems with your code, Kubernetes is not going to just by default catch everything that is wrong with it. So you want to use some sort of like source code analysis tool such as OWASP to help you analyze that source code or like compiled versions of the code to be able to find security flaws. Um, there are some more resources. I mentioned some of these on some of the previous slides as well. Um, if you go to, say, the uh, CNCF landscape, um, you can uh, see there's like a section specifically there related to things with security. Um, the landscape keeps growing. Um, if you know every single thing on landscape, that's crazy and wow. Um, I definitely don't, but it's basically like my uh, coworker and friend Josh Long basically described it as kind of like a fractal. You just like click it and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, the Kubernetes docs has a specific section on security. Um, there's the, if you're specifically and like dealing with your own cluster and, and administration of that as well, there's links to that. Um, again, there is a, there's a bunch of stuff for SIG store that you can look at as well. Um, on Friday, um, my the coworker I just mentioned, Josh, uh, who is very much into uh, Spring and Java, um, we have it's pre-recorded. So uh, since unfortunately he did not come to Dublin, um, but if you want to learn about creating Kubernetes like operators controllers um, using uh, Spring and Java, um, we have a talk on that. Uh, it's at 15:55 to 16:35. Um, at Wicklow Hall, assuming things don't change, because I've noticed a few people have been talking about the times and such for their talks have changed in the last day or so. So I guess check with that. Um, yeah, so thank you all for coming here and sitting or standing. Um, uh, special thanks to these lovely people um, who have taught me a bunch of stuff about security that I did not know in advance, because again, I went with this I proposed this talk with the goal of learning security and be able to present it from the viewpoint of somebody who is just learning it. Since a lot of times, like if you're new to something and you attend a talk by someone who's super senior, they the level of like what they just learned 
is so, like six years ago, 20 years ago, or whatever it is, and it may not be, it might be way too advanced or just a different level than um, what you might be familiar with. Um, please come and tell me your thoughts and things I should change and whatnot, since I am also giving this talk in 10 less minutes um, at uh, Cloud Native Security Con, which is the Colo event with uh, KubeCon. So, yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone. And yeah, that's my, my Twitter is has been on every slide. It's up there. I'm really bad at using it lately, but I will try to be better. Um, so, thank you. Have a good rest of your conference. <laughs>